They seem like ordinary men, articulate, educated, civilized, but they will turn into depraved, twisted monsters. They will commit acts of unimaginable cruelty, for which they will feel no shame or remorse. Here is true evil. Nuremberg, 1945. Of the leading Nazis on trial, the most infamous is Hermann Goering. The court is shown footage of the Holocaust and listens to the details of Goering's appalling crimes. But Goering does not look contrite or ashamed. At the Nuremberg trial, Goering shows his true colours. He's laughing, he's dismissive, he's arrogant, and he shows no remorse. In the Third Reich, he is second only to Hitler. He is founder of the Gestapo and of the Luftwaffe. He is the man who ordered the final solution. In its judgment, the court concludes that Hermann Goering is truly evil. In the words of the judge, his guilt is unique in its enormity. But what turned Hermann Goering into this Nazi monster. Hermann Goering is the posh Nazi. His story is that of Germany's military aristocratic elite who turned to the Nazis for salvation. The status and fortunes of Germany's aristocracy are based on land but in the early decades of the 20th century, a new Germany is emerging, an industrial and commercial Germany in which the old nobility struggle to find a role and see their incomes decline. Goering's family is part of Germany's old imperial elite. Goering's father is a former cavalry officer and colonial official. He enjoys social status. But like many of Germany's minor nobility, he hasn't the money to back it up. Goering's father, Heinrich, had worked his entire life in German bureaucracy, but when he returned to Germany, he found it almost impossible to support his family on his meagre pension. Goering's father, humiliated, is forced to turn for help to a Jewish businessman, Hermann Ritter von Eppenstein. Von Eppenstein is a nouveau riche, part of the new commercial Germany. Von Eppenstein invites the Goering family to move into one of his castles, Berg Veldenstein, but at a price. Goering's mother must be his mistress. Goering's father is incredibly emasculated. He's living in this home provided by his wife's lover, and everybody in the building, including his children, know exactly what the score is. Like the rest of the nobility, the young Goering looks down on vulgar commerce. He dreams instead of the romantic aristocratic life of a military officer. So at 16, he joins the military training college at Lichterfelder near Berlin and graduates into the Prussian army. Germany's military elite is frustrated. They yearn for the colonial jobs and lifestyle that come with running a large empire. To win such an empire, in 1914, they provoke Europe and the world into war. At last, the young officer Goering will see some action. But life in the trenches is a far cry from the heroic glamour of war as he'd imagined it. So Goering decides to train for the Air Force. Aeroplanes are new. Fighter pilots are romanticized as fearless daredevils. Soon the airplane becomes a weapon of war. Both sides experiment with bombs, aimed by the naked eye, dropped over the side by hand. Goering earns his wings and returns to the front. He is a skilled flyer. He has the fearlessness of youth and the confidence and bearing of a young aristocrat. By 1918, Goering is put in command of a squadron known as the Flying Circus, one of the most celebrated of the war. 
Goering has what might be called a good war during the First World War. He is a tremendously dashing and successful fighter ace and indeed wins Germany's highest military honour, the Paul Le Merite. This is a huge thing to win. The British equivalent would be the Victoria Cross. So he is a war hero. He is you know, fated in the popular prints. Germany's military elite are expecting to win a great victory. But the tide turns when the Americans enter. Germany's collapse is sudden and devastating. The end of the war in November 1918 comes as a shock to most Germans. It also comes as a shock to many German soldiers. Goering comes back from the war thinking that he's going to be lionised. But, of course, the Germany he finds is a Germany that he regards, like so many other men of his generation and of his military background, of a Germany that's been betrayed. The Kaiser is forced to abdicate, and in the city of Weimar, a new republic is formed. Under the terms of the surrender, Germany loses what little empire it had. Germany is forbidden from having an air force, and instead of an army, is allowed only a nominal armed force of just 100,000 men. The armed forces of Germany cease to exist. Germany is allowed to have a kind of glorified national guard. Goering can forget a career as a military officer, followed by the colonial service. The army has gone. The empire has gone. The old world of Germany's military bureaucratic ruling elite is dead. When you think of Hermann Goering, you've got to think of his background, his, his sort of military aristocracy background. In Germany at that period, the whole idea of the military was high status. So when you look at him a few years later in Weimar, Germany, where he's impotent, the whole idea of uh, the sort of romance of the military, the idea of being the soldier, you now it's gone. And, and it's not coming back. Goering is jobless, penniless, and humiliated. He sees no future for himself in the new Germany, so he leaves the country to find paid work as a pilot. Life after the war is not a bed of roses for our young war hero, Hermann Goering, with his Paul Emerite round his neck. Indeed, he just becomes a jobbing commercial pilot and really can't cover his bills as he hops from job to job around Europe. Goering gets a job briefly as a novelty stunt pilot. Before landing a job flying for a small Swedish airline. And Sweden, he starts to have what he thinks might be his entree back into the kind of high realms of society that he feels he inhabits. And he falls in love and gets engaged to a, a Swedish aristocrat called Karin. And he hopes that, you know, through her, he'll be able to once more take his place in the type of society he thinks he should be part of. You get a real sense that actually she offered him something that he didn't have. You see, afforded him a sort of sense of class. Goering and Karen marry in 1923. Karen is posh, which Goering likes. She also has some money. And with it, the two buy their first house in the Bavarian Alps, just outside Munich. But by the time Goering returns to Germany, the country is descending into chaos. To pay its war debts, the new German government has decided to print money at an incredible rate. The resulting hyperinflation wipes out the savings of ordinary Germans and wrecks the economy. Germany's once gigantic public sector is cut to the bone as the government runs out of cash. Germany's once mighty standing army is already roaming the streets, jobless, impoverished and resentful. More and more ex-German soldiers gravitate toward radical politics. All of the big German parties have paramilitary groups. The unemployed veterans form gangs which they call Freikorps. They dress in uniforms as if they were still in the army and decorate cars as military vehicles. All they need is direction. From this climate of violence, chaos and nationalism emerge Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. Hitler and the Nazi party have built up a considerable following in Munich in Goering's absence. Most of their supporters are former Freikorps members and had served in the First World War.
Goering attends a gathering in Munich and hears a passionate speech from the charismatic young political agitator Adolf Hitler. Hitler is calling for a new kind of patriotic nationalist socialism, which will rebuild Germany's military state and win back her empire. Another attraction of Nazism was that it appealed to the sort of aristocratic military sector of society. You know, these people who once had the, the, the glamour, people like Hermann Goering, who now in Weimar Germany had none of the status they had before and they didn't have hope. Goering is immediately drawn in. If Hitler's new movement takes off, there's always a chance for Goering of political or military advancement. I think there's no doubt he saw in Nazism at this early stage the chance to sort of bolster himself, to climb on a very good bandwagon, actually, something that you know, had the potential to rise up and to make him personally important and to increase his own personal status. Hitler, for his part, could use a decorated high-ranking military officer and asks Goering to be head of the Nazis' paramilitary wing, the SA. Hitler doesn't have much military credibility, but Goering really does. He is a famous and a decorated World War I flying ace. So when he takes over the SA, he does so with a background of real military experience and real military achievement. Goering, the Prussian military officer, sets out to turn the Freikorps brown shirts into a disciplined fighting force. Within a year, Hitler is so impressed by the New Look SA, he decides to use them to seize power. Hitler is inspired by the success of Benito Mussolini. The world's first fascist dictator has seized power in a coup. With Goering's help, Hitler will attempt the same in Germany. On the night of November the 8th, 1923, Hitler, with Hermann Goering at his side, storms into a beer hall in Munich with 600 of Goering's armed SA men. They take hostage dozens of Bavarian ministers. The following morning, the Nazis, now numbering 2,000, march to the Odeonsplatz and are confronted by just 130 soldiers. It's not recorded who opened fire but it was a bloodbath. In the chaos that ensued, 16 Nazis and four state policemen were killed. Hitler is arrested for treason and sent to Landsberg prison. Goering, who was shot in the groin, manages to escape to Austria. Here, he and Karen take refuge briefly with his Jewish-born godfather, von Eppenstein. The putsch is a disaster. It could easily have destroyed the Nazi party before it even got off the ground. And Goering is forced to flee into exile to Austria. Once again, his dreams have been dashed. Hermann Goering's lowest point was probably after the beer hall putsch. He found himself in a situation, first of all, where he, he, he couldn't even survive with his own money. He was reliant on his wife's parents' money even to exist. He was wounded. The drugs he was on, he was becoming addicted to. This is where his lifelong problem with drugs started. I think it really couldn't get any worse. He's separated from Germany. He's wandering Europe. He doesn't really have a role. He undertakes menial jobs. He ends up in a mental hospital for part of it. This is the lowest ebb of Goering's life. But a ray of hope comes when Goering makes a trip to Rome, where he meets the Italian dictator, Benito Mussolini. Goering is inspired by the pomp, the grand military parades, and the uniforms. It is like a Prussian officer's dream of how the world should be. And it's a dream that may yet be realized in Germany, for in 1927, the German president, Paul von Hindenburg, declares an amnesty for the Nazi agitators. Hitler is back in business, and for Goering, it's safe at last to return to Germany. Well, he returns in 1927. Hitler has been out of prison for three years, and the Nazi party has evolved. It's no longer this kind of ragtag bunch of militants and sort of, sort of lunatic paramilitaries. It's now at least trying to portray itself as a serious electoral force. Hitler welcomes Goring back with wide open arms because he's a man with connections, he's a man with charisma and charm. 
the Nazis tried to gain power through a sort of coup d'etat. That failed. It's now realized that if it is to get its hand on power, it's going to have to do it by legitimate constitutional means. Adolf Hitler, heil! Heil! Goering starts building support among Germany's upper classes. Goering is one of the only true politicians in Hitler's circle. He brings to Nazism and to Hitler's rise to power the aristocratic charm, the military heritage, the ability to schmooze and deal with the other politicians and the industrial leaders. The Nazis are giving Goering everything he ever dreamed of. He's got status, he's becoming an important man. In 1928, he is elected as a National Socialist representative to the Reichstag. At last, he is where he wants to be, mixing with the elite. But the strain of getting here has proved too much for his wife, Karen. In 1931, she suffers a heart attack. Goering is at her deathbed, but Hitler calls him back to Berlin to prepare for elections. She actually sent him down knowing that she was going to die. She's sending him down there to climb the ladder, effectively. And she knows she's not going to be part of it. Karen dies, but Goering has little time to mourn. The Nazi party soon becomes the largest party in the Reichstag, and the newly appointed Reichstag president will be Hermann Goering. Within a year, Adolf Hitler is appointed chancellor of Germany. Hitler gets a tremendous ovation when leaving for his first cabinet meeting. When Hitler's name Chancellor becomes the Fuhrer, Goering is brought along with the Fuhrer as his right-hand man, as his second-in-command, as his most important confidant. Goering is allowed to form not only the Gestapo, but he's also tasked as the head of the new Luftwaffe, the Air Force. It's a vindication for him of all the aspirations he had in his life. Suddenly he has status. Suddenly he has recognition. Hitler's new government imposes total state control. That includes the regulation of all economic activity. And the man Hitler puts in charge of this newly regulated German economy is Hermann Goering. State control hands huge power to public officials. Thousands of restrictions are imposed on the conduct of business by an ever-growing army of government bureaucrats. Ordinary Germans now need a license to do anything, to produce, to trade, to buy, to sell. To get anything done, you need the cooperation of several Nazi bureaucrats, and for this, they must be bribed. Corruption was endemic in Nazi Germany. It was incredibly widespread. It's almost the way it functions. The local officials used to extort their power to collect fines and confiscate property. We think of the Nazis as this well-oiled, efficient machine, but actually it was riddled with corruption. Whatever the economic activity, whatever the business, Nazi state officials take their cut. And the Nazis taking the biggest cuts are those at the top. The idea of appointing Hermann Goering as your Minister of Economics is farcical. This is a man who will become one of the world's greatest thieves. He runs essentially what is a kleptocracy. It is a nation run through robbery. Large industrial firms bribe Nazi officials to win huge tax-funded government war contracts. Smaller businesses are simply milked dry by the Nazis. But there is one section of the German population that the Nazis will bleed above all others. In 1935, Goering introduces the anti-Jewish Nuremberg laws. German citizens are only those of German or related blood willing to serve the German Reich and people. The Jews, say the Nazis, are a different race and must be kept apart. Marriages between Jews and citizens of German or related blood are prohibited. The Jews are to be forced out of Germany, but as they leave, their assets will be seized. The private property of Germany's Jews represents a welcome new source of revenue. 
for the Nazis and for Goering in particular. The confiscation of all Jewish property is entirely justified in the eyes of the Nazi party. The Jews, they say, have exploited and robbed the German people with their capitalist profiteering. The Nazi justification for this mass plunder and theft was very simple. They deserved it. They were the master race. They, 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 they were the rightful owners of this material. Under National Socialism, all property is at the disposal of the state, and it's Goering and his Nazi friends who control the state. Goering can do what he likes. His father had status without money. Goering will have both. And as Goering now demonstrates, his greed is limitless. There was so much being taken from the Jews constantly. And if you're in a position like Hermann Goering, if you're at the top of the tree, then it's yours for the taking. Goering made a lot of money out of the Jewish situation. His anti-Semitism is of a somewhat different variety than uh, Heinrich Himmler's. It's not so much rooted in crackpot notions about biology and inheritance and ancestry. I don't think Hermann Goering really cares about that. He is, of course, interested in making a determination as to who is Jewish or who is not Jewish because he wants to steal as much of the wealth of Germany and Europe's Jewish population as he possibly can. National Socialism has given Hermann Goering incredible power and wealth. He can now indulge his fantasies. He will live the life of a grand Prussian aristocrat and his vanity, extravagance, and greed will know no bounds. Like Mussolini, Goering loves to dress up. He designs for himself countless elaborate military uniforms, which he decorates with self-awarded medals. And when he's not in uniform, he adopts the archaic Germanic style of hunting dress befitting a landowning aristocrat. People begin to see him as quite an affected figure. He's slightly pretentious. Goering lives the high life, eating and drinking his fill. And as he does, his expensive clothes are getting bigger and bigger. Goering starts cutting an increasingly absurd figure, and even the German population, despite being under the grip of Nazism, are privately laughing at this man because he's getting enormous. I mean, his stomach is huge, and he, he must weigh nearly sort of 300 pounds. So he's seriously fat. He's morbidly obese. What the German public don't know is that he has a rather nasty drug habit, and he's addicted to all manner of pharmaceuticals, as well as food. Total state power gives the Nazi leaders almost regal status. And when Goering marries the actress Emmy Sonnemann in 1935, it's like a royal wedding. I think it says a great deal about Hermann Goering that he had the most astonishingly lavish wedding, second wedding. Berlin was basically shut down to traffic for seven hours so that 30,000 marchers could march in his honour. The British ambassador actually went along to the wedding and he was just staggered by it. But what this wedding was really all about was Hermann Goering's status. The fact that, as the British ambassador said, you know, he really couldn't go any higher short of being made a king. The couple move into Goering's newly expanded estate of Karinhall. Karinhall, which is about 50 miles from Berlin, is probably the most extravagant example of the use of architecture in a private sense by the Nazi uh, leadership. It was named Karinhall after his first wife, Karin Fock, who died at a young age. Karin was buried there in the grounds. With taxpayers' money, Goering spends a fortune turning his private house into a grand stately home, opulently decorated and maintained by a small army of servants. Goering is like a debauched Roman emperor, his limitless gluttony and extravagance supported by the corrupt nationalist socialist state. 
Hitler has no complaints about Goering's avarice for one simple reason. As head of state, Hitler's cut of the spoils is even bigger than Goering's. Hitler doesn't flaunt his plundered wealth in quite the same way. Nazi propaganda presents Hitler in ordinary lounge suits and simple uniforms, as humble, even frugal. The idea that Hitler was just this man of, of very moderate tastes um, and, and, and didn't have access to uh, that much wealth it's not true. Hitler was incredibly wealthy. He charged a copyright fee for his likeness on postage stamps, um, and he also earned an absolute fortune in royalties from Mein Kampf. I mean, he was staggeringly rich. By the late 1930s, the Nazis have rebuilt a Prussian-style military bureaucratic state. But Germany's vast war machine must pay for itself, and that means conquest. At the top of Hitler's list of targets is Austria. But Goering is at first nervous of war. He is enjoying his status and growing wealth. Why put it at risk? As you can see from his wedding, Hermann Goering is very happy with the way things are going. He's lining his pockets, he's living very, very well, he's content. Goering didn't want war with Austria. That was going to upset his apple cart. So he pushed very much for the Anschluss, for the annexation of Austria. And it worked very, very well. Instead of invading, Hitler bullies the Austrian government into unification with Germany. But many Austrians are happy with this. And when the Germans march in, they're greeted by cheering crowds and Nazi salutes. Goering, too, is delighted. Austria has a large, successful Jewish population whose wealth he now intends to plunder. He will rob them of treasure, artwork, cash, gold, you name it. But annexing little Austria is not enough, either to meet the financial needs of the German superstate or to satisfy Hitler's imperial ambitions. So on September the 1st, Hitler invades Poland. Two days later, Britain and France respond by declaring war on Germany. Once again, a vain German ruling elite has dragged Europe into bloody conflict. Goering did not want war, but since it is here, he will take full advantage. As the German army marches into Paris, it is quickly followed by Goering's treasure hunters. Goering does not confine himself to robbing Jewish people. The whole of Europe's artistic treasures are there for the taking. Priceless works of art are shamelessly taken from the Louvre, as well as from private collections. As the Third Reich conquers territories, Goering will fill his coffers with more and more treasure, literal treasure. Goering sends his own men to pick through the national treasures of all Nazi-occupied Europe. The Nazis construct new museums in Germany to show off some of their prizes. But the great bulk of the loot ends up in the private collection of Goering and other senior Nazis. Goering, in particular, would take what he wanted for himself and apportion out gifts to people, of course, Adolf Hitler, but others that he favored, and then he would sell off parts of what the regime had stolen, and the profits would largely go to him. These are art treasures from Paris. These are bits of churches from Denmark that have been ripped to pieces and put up in his estate. This is gold from Poland. These are jewels from Prague. This is Europe's wealth, all coalescing into his pockets. Goering's interest is not just aesthetic, he becomes probably the most successful thief of the Nazi regime. National socialism, particularly when it came to Jews in Germany and outside of Germany, was a project of robbery on a massive scale, and Hermann Goering was the master thief. Is Goering really a great aficionado of art? I'm not so sure. Isn't it what it represents that means something to him? And so if he's able to surround himself with great art, the sort of great art in the past was only accessible 
If you were an aristocrat, if you were somebody right at the top of the social tree, then my goodness me, he's made it. And there it is all around him. So, yeah, Goering is a man of substance. Congratulations. Although Goering is swimming in treasure, he's been careful to make sure Hitler gets more than his share. Hitler, in recognition, bestows even more power on Goering. Hitler rewards Goering by appointing him as his successor. By 1941, Hermann Goering, second only to Hitler in the Nazi hierarchy, has largely expropriated Europe's Jewish population. The penniless Jews are no longer of any use to Goering or the Nazi state. They will be worked to death as slave laborers or else dispensed with entirely. To this end, on the 31st of July, 1941, Hermann Goering sends a memo to Reinhard Heydrich, asking him to start work on the so-called final solution to the Jewish question. In this letter, Goering authorizes the Holocaust. Goering was already quite the monster, but it's really the letter he sends to Heydrich uh, with the instructions to carry out the final solution. That cements his reputation as one of the most kind of deplorable monsters that nature ever suffered to cruel the surface of the earth. Goering's descent into moral oblivion is complete. But though he doesn't realize it, the chain of events leading to his downfall has already begun. Of all the leaders of Germany's nationalist socialist state, Hermann Goering is the most adept at turning power into wealth. But Goering is about to pay for his crimes. And the story of his downfall begins with the Battle of Britain. To win the war, Hitler must knock out Britain. But invasion by sea is impossible. German ships are too vulnerable to attack from the British Air Force. To conquer Britain, Hitler must first win control of the skies. And to do that, he turns to the commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering. The Battle of Britain, basically, was a precursor to the invasion of Britain. If dominance could be achieved over the skies of southern England and the Channel, then the Germans had a good chance of invading and succeeding. If the Luftwaffe couldn't succeed, then Germany couldn't invade Britain. Goering's Luftwaffe is supposed to be the most advanced military air force in the world, and he starts the Battle of Britain with more than four times as many planes as the RAF. But in other ways, the Luftwaffe is outclassed. Britain has better planes, better pilots, and better military intelligence. Goering is shocked when German losses are almost twice as high as Britain's. Within months, Goering finds that he's running out of pilots and aircraft. Defeat in the Battle of Britain is a huge blow to the Luftwaffe, to Hitler, and also to Goering. The Nazis now have no hope of invading Britain, and for this, many in the Nazi high command blame Hermann Goering. Hermann Goering had demonstrated his fallibility, and this kind of starts to coincide with the fallibility of the German war machine in general. And I think you could call this a real turning point in the war. The Luftwaffe isn't just outfought, it's also being outproduced. The British were slow to arm, but now its factories are turning out an extraordinary 300 planes a week. By 1943, America will be producing 250 military planes a day. Goering's attempt to mass produce planes is a failure. A new version of the Messerschmitt fighter plane is poorly designed, and far too few of them are being produced. And it's not just planes. Germany's war effort relies on its state-controlled industry. But Germany's heavily regulated planned economy is in crisis.
Goering is imposing socialist regulation on the economy. But far from making industry more efficient, state bureaucratic control is causing shortages and chaos. Germany is even running short of coal and steel, which it once produced in enormous quantities. To make matters worse, there is no more money to be had from expropriating the Jews. Nazi plundering had become essential to the German economy. German industry was underperforming, and the Nazis desperately needed cash and resources. It's not just theft for things looking pretty, it's theft to make guns. In state-controlled Nazi Germany, there's now a shortage of everything, including workers who are taken from the factories to fight. To deal with the labor shortage, Goering arranges for hundreds of thousands of Jews, Poles, Ukrainians, and countless others to be herded into the factories and labor camps. There, they will slave until they die from starvation or exhaustion. The labor camps are feeding their inmates on a starvation diet. The life expectancy is only a few months. But these wretched slaves are too hungry, too feeble, and too hateful to be effective workers. The standard and quantity of what they produce cannot match that of the Allies. What's more, the slave laborers try to disrupt production whenever they can. By the start of 1944, Goering's Luftwaffe is crumbling before his eyes. Allied fighters are overwhelming Goering's squadrons. In the single month of February, the Luftwaffe loses a third of its fighters. The following month, it loses more than half of what's left. Denuded of air cover from Goering's Luftwaffe, German factories, docks and airports, its towns and cities are all sitting ducks. The Allies drop millions of tons of bombs. Hamburg, the second largest city in Germany, is all but destroyed. So too Darmstadt and Cologne. German cities are reduced to smoking rubble. Factories destroyed, hundreds of thousands of civilians killed, millions more are made homeless. And who is the Nazi whose job it was to defend them? The corpulent, arrogant Hermann Goering. The RAF and the US Air Force have got complete control of the German sky. The German military is crumbling, and uh, amidst all this decline, Goering loses touch with reality. He kind of retreats into himself um, and lives in this kind of fantasy world. He refuses to take bad news, he refuses to have meetings with his officers, and ends up in this state of self-induced obliviousness in an effort to block out the harsh reality for him, which is that Germany is on the cusp of huge and uh, irrevocable defeat. June the 6th, 1944. D-Day. The Allies land in Normandy. There is hardly a Luftwaffe plane in sight. The Allies control all of the airspace over Normandy and the beaches and over northern France. On D-Day itself, especially in the west, the Germans are outnumbered at about 30 to 1, and they will not be able to overcome those odds for the rest of the war. A furious Joseph Goebbels screams to his confidants that Goering should be court-martialed for his incompetence. But it's all too late. By spring 1945, Nazi Germany is devastated. The last battle, the Battle of Berlin, is about to begin. Goering can feel Hitler's power quickly ebbing away. By April 1945, Goering has basically come to the conclusion that the war is lost. Hitler is a spent force. Hitler is just sitting in his bunker, and there's nothing to be gained by waiting for his instructions. Goering now tries to save his own skin. If he takes over from Hitler as leader, 
Perhaps he, Goering, can negotiate some kind of deal with the Americans and British. Goering will offer the Allies German help to contain the threat of totalitarian communism. But first, he must persuade Hitler to step aside. He sends Hitler a very carefully worded telegram, basically suggesting that when the time comes, he should take over. And it's already been agreed, actually. It's not as though he's considering anything completely new or anything completely outrageous. But Goering's bid for power backfires. This telegram to Hitler is intercepted by Goering's enemies, of whom he has a few, and they manage to turn it, in Hitler's mind, into an act of betrayal. He leaves orders, first of all, that, that Goering is thrown out of the party, he's certainly not going to succeed him, and that he's actually going to be killed. There are orders given to the SS that Goering is going to be executed. And just days after that, Hitler shoots himself in the bunker. Soviet troops are closing in from the east. American and British troops are taking over in the west. German forces everywhere are surrendering. Goering wants to flee westwards to avoid the wrath of the Russians, but his greed slows him down. He spends valuable time loading convoys of trucks and even whole trains with as much treasure as he can. Then he tries to cover his tracks. Goering had a carinol destroyed. He had it bombed by the Luftwaffe to get rid of it as the Russians were advancing towards Berlin. And now all that remains are the um, two, two gate posts. Goering's vast convoy of stolen treasure moves slowly and is impossible to hide. Goering and his loot are soon intercepted by a division of American soldiers. An American army cameraman captures the moment Goering is arrested. Dressed still in one of his lavish uniforms, he is forced to hand over his revolver. When American troops search the convoy, they can hardly believe their eyes. When he's captured, Goering just has the most over-the-top entourage you can imagine. He's got 20 vehicles, he's got some 75 people with him, including a chef, a valet, guards, you, you name it. Boxes full of uniforms and treasure, scuttling for safety with as much as he can carry. Goering, along with 40 other high-ranking Nazis, is taken to a special prison established in a luxury hotel in Luxembourg. The Nazis are delighted to be treated so well and open up to their captors. But the American officers with whom they're mixing are intelligence agents. Goering plays the imperious aristocrat. He flaunts his diamond-studded cap and his jewel-encrusted epaulets and medals. He's allowed to walk in the grounds with his dog. He is boastful and unguarded in his comments. Goering, bizarrely, again, it speaks to his arrogance, doesn't seem to grasp the gravity of the situation, and he begins to open overtures with General Eisenhower, you know, the, the commander of the American forces, and actually offers his help in running a new kind of German government. But the VIP treatment is short-lived. Goering is now transferred to a cramped prison cell in Nuremberg, ready to stand trial for his crimes. Months of prison gruel and the stress of incarceration leaves Goering looking thinner, his clothes ill-fitting. But prison at least cures him of his addiction to morphine. On November the 20th, 1945, Hermann Goering, hiding his face, is led to the Nuremberg courtroom. He is accused of crimes against peace, initiating wars of aggression, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. He seems to have regained some of the sharpness of his younger years and lost none of his languid, aristocratic Prussian arrogance. He is nervous. Yet he smiles and smirks when the prosecution lawyers are making their case. 
scoffing at the evidence brought forward. I want to see whether or not you did have insight into these matters. Goering shows his true colors at the trial. He's arrogant, he shows no remorse, he's laughing, he's dismissive. This is the real Goering. But for Goering, there is no defense. The court has shown hours of footage of the horrific atrocities committed on his orders. The slave labor program, the gas chambers, the piles upon piles of corpses. The prosecution brings forward a letter signed by Goering authorizing the beginning of the final solution. Goering is one of the architects of the Nazi regime, and he bears an enormous amount of responsibility for the way the economy was set up, for his role in the Luftwaffe at the beginning of the war, essentially as Hitler's number two. And he also has to be remembered for his insatiable greed and his arrogance. A truly awful man. Goering is found guilty on all counts. Hermann Wilhelm Goering, the International Military Bill, sentences you to death by hanging. <laughs> Conceited and deluded to the end, Goering demands to be shot as befitting a soldier. But the judges are having none of it. He will be hanged like the disgusting criminal he is. The time comes to escort Hermann Goering to the gallows. But when soldiers arrive at his cell, they find him dead. Goering has swallowed a cyanide capsule. Hermann Goering, the haughty Prussian officer and would-be aristocrat, had craved status and money. The Nazi totalitarian state, corrupt, parasitic, murderous, offered him plenty of both. All Goering had to do was sell his soul.